Hello and welcome to What the Pulse Ox Tells You. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's first talk about what's happening that we're going to be assessing with our pulse ox. We're looking at our gas exchange and how much oxygen gets into the bloodstream. So when you take a look at the diagram on the left, you're going to see where all this action occurs. All the action occurs in that alveolus. So we have this alveolar cluster on the left, and you can see we have our arterioles going to it and our venules going to it. And then over on the right-hand side, a breakdown of one alveolus, and we're showing the blood flow going around that alveolus. So we're giving off CO2 and oxygen is going into the bloodstream. So that's the first step in the process. It would be nice if we could know how much oxygen is getting across that alveolar capillary membrane and directly into the bloodstream, but that's going to be very hard to read. We can't stick something into the lung and find out how much oxygen has gotten into the bloodstream right there in the lung. So we have to take a surrogate, which is going to be our pulse ox. Now when oxygen first moves across that alveolar capillary membrane, it's going to dissolve in the blood. And that's what this diagram is illustrating for us, is those little round, kind of clear looking circles are going to represent the oxygen that is dissolved in the blood. Some of that dissolved oxygen will bind to hemoglobin, and that's the part that's going to be taken to the tissues in the body. The oxygen that's dissolved in the blood cannot be used, for the most part, by our tissues. It has to be the oxygen that's on the hemoglobin. However, oxygen has to dissolve into the bloodstream first. And by the way, when you're looking at your blood gas, that's going to be your PO2, before it can bind to hemoglobin and become your oxygen saturation. Now you may have heard at one point in time about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. We have a process that's occurring in the body where oxygen from the lungs is combining with hemoglobin and then it goes out into the tissues and is released. A little more detail here. First of all, those hemoglobin molecules over on the left hand side in the red blood cell are not completely devoid of having oxygen. So the oxygen in our venous blood is less than it is in the arterial blood, but there is still some oxygen in the venous blood. Oxygen will bind to hemoglobin as it passes that oxygen-rich blood, and then it gets to the tissues and it will unload a certain amount of oxygen at the tissue level. So our illustration on the right here that's showing that all of the oxygen dumps off into the tissues really is not very accurate because we don't release all the oxygen from that red blood cell to the tissue. The unloading process is going to be affected by a number of different variables. When our oxygen binds to hemoglobin, we want to measure how much of our hemoglobin is going to be bound with oxygen. So if these are all the hemoglobins and little white spots there, uh, the little white circles are the areas where oxygen can bind to hemoglobin, this would be a patient who has a oxygen saturation of zero. There's no saturation. None of those hemoglobins have been saturated with oxygen. However, if we were to add some oxygen to those hemoglobins, and now we have some of them bound with hemoglobin, or bound with oxygen, like in this case here, out of those 10 hemoglobins, three of them have oxygen bound to them. Therefore, we would say we have a 30% oxygen saturation. Add some more, now we're up to a 50% oxygen saturation. So we're literally measuring how much hemoglobin has oxygen bound to it when we're looking at the oxygen saturation. Remember again, this part is really important because this is what the tissues use. So how are we measuring this with a pulse ox? Well, here's our artery in the finger, and you can see that on either side of that finger we have a detector and we have a light-emitting diode. On the top side there, you see the light-emitting diode, which is sending red light and infrared light through the tissue, through that finger. On the other side, those lights are being going to be detected by the photodetector. Red light will be taken up by the hemoglobin 
in uh, direct proportion to how much oxygen has been bound to hemoglobin so that then we can be able to read our oxygen saturation. Now keep in mind that other light in the room, if there's other light that's interfering, so maybe this patient has their hand in direct sunlight or there's fluorescent lights on in their room, those lights can interfere with how well this thing reads. If you're having trouble getting a pulse ox on someone, a good suggestion would be to put their hand under the covers and try to keep it out of the direct light. You might get a better reading that way. Pulse ox is going to create a waveform. This waveform literally is the pulse. It's reading the pulse. So the way that the pulse ox is going to be able to tell the difference between oxygen on arterial blood and oxygen in venous blood is by looking for that pulse. So we want to see that there is a pulse ox waveform. This would indicate that our pulse ox is reading our arterial blood rather than reading our venous blood. So you expect to see a waveform that looks something like this. In this case here, you see over on the right hand side, the pulse ox is reading an SpO2 of 97%. Keep in mind that our pulse ox is going to give us an SpO2 okay, because it's a pulse ox. We're reading this from outside the body with this light device as opposed to an SaO2, which would be the reading you get from your blood gas. So in a blood gas, we're directly measuring the amount of oxygen in the blood, which is a little different than indirectly measuring it using a pulse ox. There are some problems with pulse oximetry. First of all, it is peripheral. We usually want to know whether or not the central organs are receiving enough oxygen. But a peripheral oxygen reading will give us some idea as to what the patient's overall oxygen saturation looks like. Keep in mind that in order for an oxygen saturation to decrease, in order for this pulse ox to decrease, first the patient has to decrease the amount of oxygen they're getting into the lung, decrease the amount of oxygen going across that alveolar or capillary membrane, and or have less circulating oxygen, PO2, to be able to bind to hemoglobin. So something is happening first. In other words, the SpO2, or our pulse ox reading, is not going to be an early indicator of some dysfunction. In fact, it's going to be a later sign that we have some dysfunction. Also keep in mind that it relies on red light. Red light is a very slow waveform and can be interfered with by many other types of light. So again, if you're having trouble getting a pulse ox on somebody, stick it under the covers, stick it under something so get it in the dark and you might get a better waveform. Reads everything that's bound to hemoglobin, including carbon monoxide. And remember that the SpO2 is different than the SaO2. SaO2 comes from our blood gas. SpO2 comes from the pulse ox. SpO2 is peripheral and it's also going to be indirect because we're using that light source outside the body. If you'd like to know more about handling nursing emergencies, check out our program at thenursingprof.com to decrease complications, rapidly detect problems, and implement prompt action. Thank you for joining me for What Pulse Ox Tells You. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, bye now.